Welcome to Here She Stands, the podcast where Lutheran women from across Australia come together as a community, sharing stories and testifying to God's goodness. We do this so when the tribulations of this world try to push us down, we can hold firm to the word of God and confidently say, here I stand, I can do no other. My name is Lexi and I'm the wife of a pastoral student and a homeschooling mama. And I'm Sonia, a Lutheran pastor's wife, homeschooling mum and homemaker. Welcome to another episode of Here She Stands. Today's guest is Juanita Wood. Juanita lives in the USA and is a wife to Tim and mother of three mostly grown kids, Jessica, Gregory, who are in their early 20s, and Naomi, who is a teenager. She and Tim are the owners of Ad Crusum, a confessional Lutheran store. Today, she'll be sharing more of her story and how she and Tim started Ad Crusum. She will also be talking about Lutheran expression and why it is important. So welcome to our podcast, Juanita. It's lovely to have you here. Well, thank you very much. It's lovely to meet you both and thank you for inviting me. It's it's a great honor to be with you. Yeah, once again, we're doing it at very different time zones in the world between the three of us. We've got Lexi here as well. Hi, Lexi. Hello Hi, Lexi. and welcome, Juanita. Thank you very much. So let's start with a little bit of your story. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself, where you live? Sure. I was born in South Africa, so that was 50 odd years ago, and raised in South Africa in an unchurched family. The first time I went to church was with a friend of my mother, who was, uh, I was about five years old, and she took me to a Baptist church close to where we lived. And I was actually blown away by the experience. It was just the most beautiful thing I'd ever encountered. And I remember hearing that the Lord never rests and he never closes his eyes. And, you know, I was just amazed by that. It, I'd never heard of anything like this before. And I went home that night and I prayed to him and I said to him, you know, Lord, your eyes must get so very tired and I'm so sorry for you. And I, I just had this huge empathy for the Lord. And then my mom's friend actually got sick and she never took me to church again. But when I was about 10, my mother became a Christian in the Word of Faith movement. And I gave my life to Jesus, you know, ran forward like everybody seems to do. And that was, uh, it was an experience, you know, in retrospect, the Word of Faith movement in the 80s was very different from the Word of Faith movement in this day and age. It, it was still Christian to some extent. It hadn't gone completely off the rails, but it was also the name it and claim it stuff and, you know, all these expecting God to do big miracles. There was a man who was at a different church from ours who was promising to raise people from the dead. And of course, none of that happened. And he made a huge embarrassment of himself. And during that time, my parents got divorced and I prayed and prayed that, and I stood on the word of God that my parents would get back together and that my family would be healed. And of course, that didn't happen. And all the claiming that I had been making didn't transpire so that by the end, uh, end of school, I was really upset with the Lord and I went to university vowing to, you know, find some other religion where I would have my desires met. And I studied religion and at university. I studied Hinduism and Buddhism and Judaism. But I knew the truth. I knew that Jesus was the only way. And it was just out of bitterness towards him that I was sort of acting out. And then I met, met my husband and we became friends right from the first early weeks of university at the University of Advertisement. And we were friends for about two years before we started going out. And his family was Baptist. And I realized that, you know, my bitterness was very unfounded, that, the, you know, not all Christians are like the ones that we ended up encountering in the Word of Faith movement. And you know, through marriage and through studying the Word of God, I healed from the very traumatic experiences that we had had. And then we attended a Baptist church in South Africa, and we eventually emigrated to the United States in 2000. And uh, we were first in New Jersey and spent a good long time looking for a church in New Jersey. 
And it was, you know, Christianity is very different from the Christianity that my husband had grown up to, grown up in, in South Africa. And we really didn't settle in a good church. And then we went to St. Louis, where it's the hotbed of Lutheranism, but we didn't know about Lutheranism at that point. So we we just searched for a church. We were in St. Louis for five years, and it was only in the fourth year or so that we finally found a church we, where we felt we could attend weekly. And it was, you know, it, it was just a run of a mill evangelical church. And my husband was doing the Sunday school for them and was looking for good resources. And every time he found anything, it happened to be Lutheran. And he, you know, he, he couldn't accept that because, of course, the Lutherans baptize babies. And, you know, our, our confession is so different from, from the evangelical confession. But through more and more study, you know, he, he was drawn to, to Lutheranism. And I was a little bit slower to the mark than he and so we were sort of leaving St. Louis at that point and having to move to Denver. And by the time we got to Denver, he said to me, well, we're either becoming Reformed or we're becoming Lutheran. So we found home in Denver that was close to a Reformed church because we thought that we would end up attending there. And the first week that we were there, we just were not comfortable at all, not one of us. And the next week, the woman who was living across the street from us said to me, well, why don't you come to our church? We're Lutheran. So we went to the church with them and each one of us felt at home immediately. You know, the confession and the absolution were just something that we had never experienced before. And you felt as though all your angst was just taken away from you with those few words said at the beginning of a service. And our children were baptized about a month or so after we started attending the church and we were taken into adult catechism. The pastor would come to our home every week and, you know, teach us. And it, it was just so beautiful. Everything that you dream that Christianity should be, in Lutheranism it is. And we've, we've been at home in the Lutheran church ever since. Yeah. I'm curious, you said that Christianity in South Africa is quite different to what you experienced when you first moved to the US. What do you mean by that? It was far more conservative. Well, my husband's church was far more conservative. Obviously, the Rhema stuff was, or the Word of Faith stuff was all the same. But, you know, his his church was just more conservative and more staid than what we encountered. And also, there's so many different varieties of Baptist in America that we, maybe we just didn't encounter the one that was closest to his, his environment. It was a bit of a culture shock for you. Yeah. Even in the church. Hmm. So how did you then end up with an online store that sells Lutheran things well, in 2000, shortly after we had emigrated, it was Christmas, and my husband's daughter and I, she was a year old at the time, we were living in New Jersey, as I said, so we decided to drive down to Washington and then down to this little town called Williamsburg and then take the bridge back up to Lewis and, and back to, to New Jersey. So when we were down in Williamsburg, we hadn't ever heard of it, but it's really an amazingly quaint little town. And there was a Christmas store there. Now, being from South Africa, I hadn't ever been into a Christmas store before. And I was all excited to see it. And we went in. And apart from a couple of nativities, there was nothing that was Christian in it. And I said to my husband then, if ever I can afford it, I would like to have a Christian Christmas store. And so that's how that idea started. And 13 years later, after we'd become Lutheran and, you know, just dreaming about this all those years, he was one of the delegates to the LCMS's National Convention in St. Louis that year. And he met up with an artist and he contacted me, or my husband contacted me and said, you know, I think it's time for us to start your dream. Let's, let's start the store. So we started, we struggled initially to get ornaments made. So we started with 27 greeting cards and we worked on the theology and all that. And actually, Pastor Wolf Mueller helped me to make sure that the theology was correct and sound with each of the cards. And we, we've started from that. So yeah, the first, first things we did were the greeting cards. And then we 
struggled with a few other things. We did some ornaments, but it was expensive because we weren't making them ourselves. We were getting somebody else to make them. And, you know, she was, she was charging us an absolute fortune. And then we got a hobbyist laser and were able to start cutting our ornaments ourselves. I think we poisoned ourselves in the process because it was going day and night in the basement of our house. And... <laughs> And the children sleep in the basement. So it was just a, a, a very tough time. And then after that, we moved the lasers out into our garage. But it was very cold. We would be out there blow drying them with a hairdryer in order to get them to start working again. And that was, it was tough times. Mm -hmm. So after that, we grew some more because we actually launched at Crucem on the 18th of April and in 2014. And the reason that's that important that it was that date is that that was Good Friday that year. So I had tried to start it on the 1st of April and the greeting cards were just delayed in getting here and delayed in getting here. And we got the cards and were able to start it on Good Friday. So add Crusoe means to the cross and that's that's how it panned out. On Good Friday, we got the business and then we moved out of the house eventually and we we launched on my birthday, on my 50th birthday. So it was as though the Lord was saying it was, you know, his business, but it's my business as well. So, so it's great to, to just sort of think of auspicious dates that we did these things. So we started in a little strip mall that it's actually, it was run by a school. So they rented out various shops in the school to people who were associated with the Christian school. And that's where we started with our first shop. And then we moved into these premises a year and a half ago. So you have a physical store as well as an online store? We do. The You know, the funny thing is that mostly when we do have people coming in, they've come from across the country and it's sort of a pilgrimage to come and visit us. We don't have very many walk-in customers and 99% of our orders are online. So behind me here, I don't know if you can see, in that room we've got the UV bed printer and then in the room next door we've got roll printer for printing our posters and things. And then in the other room across the way there, we've got our laser cutter. And then we've got a CNC machine in our garage. And we're about to get a larger CNC machine, which means that one of the cars is going to have to sleep outside soon. <laughs> So we're forever yeah. growing and forever doing something. Yes. Okay. So you started in 2014, you said. That's um, right, yeah. We celebrated our so, 10th birthday in March, of, yes. uh, in April of this year. Yes. So it's taken 10 years from when you were doing it in the basement of your home to having the store and the space. And yes. That's right. So you mentioned that you started with greeting cards and some ornaments. So what stock do you have now? What do you sell now at Ad Crucem? We've still got ornaments. We've got 100 Christmonds. Christmonds were invented, if you can call it that, by a Lutheran lady in the 50s. And the Christian monograms, which is where she got the name from. So it was funny because becoming Lutheran, all of a sudden there was actually a Christian Christmas ornament idea already. We sell a number of them. So we, we sell them to the churches. We've got them in different sizes, six inch, four and a half inch and three and a half inch. So the churches generally take the, the six inch ones for next to their chancels or somewhere in the church. And they are very good sort of learning tools because the children can learn what all the, the different symbols mean and how they pertain to Christ. And we wrote a book actually going through it in terms of the church year. So we started in Advent and we've got different ornaments for important events within the year. So it's a very liturgically based little book. And then it's got a hymn that, that goes with the ornament of the day. And just how various ornaments have various meanings and how they can be used almost in a devotional way. Hmm. Oh, then we've got lots of jewelry now. I've got somebody who's replicated Martin Luther's ring for us. And he's made crucifixes for us and another ring and an Agnes Day pendant and Pelican in her piety pendant and various Luther Rose pendants. So. Well, I only use sterling silver and gold. I don't have much in the line of other metals. But then we've got somebody on the website who does create, or she, I think she purchases more than creates, different 
crucifixes and things that she sells. And the website sort of is home to other artists. So not just Ad Crucem. We've got two people who do Jekli prints and some people who do crucifixes and then the jewelry and a couple of authors as well. So Ad Crucem is growing into the publishing business. We published a book by Professor David Scare last month about uh, dealing with antinomianism and how he's been dealing with antinomianism th- since the 70s. So it's major essays that he's written over the last 50 years. And then we've got a Bible commentary by Dr. Kuntz that he's done the first the first in the uh, series of five books. And by Christmas time, he will have a second one out and we'll grow it each year so that each year he writes more of the, the Bible commentary. And yeah, then the Christian Christmas tree book, which is all about our Christ mons. And then we're in the process of producing a Spanish pastel. And my husband's got some other books up his sleeve that he's he's working on and working with different authors in, to, in producing. So that's where his interests lie. And my interests lie at the moment in our faux window clings. So we do faux stained glass and it costs probably 1% of what it would cost to have genuine stained glass put on windows. And it it really comes out nicely Uh, when you are up close. Only then can you see that it's actually something that's been applied to the window and that it's not real. So that's one of my most exciting and one of my favorite things to do because, you know, the design process and ensuring that the, the window clings are, are well fitting and just the whole process is, is something that I thoroughly enjoy. So that's where I'm at at the moment. Yes. My husband and I were looking at the Ad Cruesome website a couple of days ago. We go on there semi-regularly and he loves the stained glass window clings. He would love to get some because they are so beautiful and Many of us, our church buildings are quite plain. We don't have the option of building cathedrals or a lot of us just end up in very plain looking buildings. And it's such a beautiful way and a beautiful reverent way to dedicate the building to God and to make it look reverent unto the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. My oldest is living in Rome this year. So my husband's got a conference that takes us to Switzerland every year for his day job. So we we went down to Rome after having visited with her or uh, having had the conference and then we went to visit with her and just seeing the beauty of those churches and how much was made of them and how much was made to glorify the Lord. And I just feel that our efforts are so paltry with the little bit that we do here and how much more we could do if we if we were just able to, you know, just such beautiful stuff. And we are sadly lacking, I'm afraid. Yes, absolutely. And what is the market for confessional Lutheran items like in the USA at the moment? The market is small. We knew that going in. It's never really been about money. In fact, after 10 years, we've never taken a cent out of this business. Every cent that we make, we put back into it and we grow it. So we just, you know, we make things that we we want to make and things that are beautiful to us and that glorify the Lord. As I said, my husband's got a day job, so he he works during the day and then he comes across to me in the afternoon and he works here printing stuff for me here. And then he goes home and he works on the CNC machine machine at home. So, you know, we've we've got a lot of work that that we've got and a lot of ideas that we have. And the only limitation is the time. And we can just, you know, work on that as we can. So we've grown. It's not easy to to start a Lutheran business. I've seen so many come and go over the years. And it's sad really. I think that, you know, people think that they can design a couple of things and that, that that will be enough to turn it into a business. But it's actually, it's not an easy thing to do. It's just a lot of slog. And yet it, it gives us a huge amount of fulfillment. And I always said, you know, if I was going to sell something, it had to have meaning. But then you realize that the gospel is something that should be given away for free. And um, that it's a difficult place to be in when you're selling things that, that are Christ-focused because, you know, it's, it shouldn't be about selling. So it's a weird little conundrum, but we make the best of it. Yes. Yeah, there's there's not much of an overlap with other denominations. We find that the Catholics want to buy Catholic things and the evangelicals don't understand us at all. 
And very often we get told, oh, you know, Jesus is no longer on the cross, so you shouldn't have a corpus on the crucifix. But, you know, then you say to them, well, you know, the two thieves on either side weren't on the cross either after the, the sun went down. So that's really not the issue. The fact is, you know, he's no longer in the tomb. And that's what we celebrate. And, you know, we celebrate him being on the cross because that's where he paid for our transgressions and when he t took all that sin upon himself. So that is, you know, it's so focal and so important to what we proclaim. And the crucifix is, yeah, it's an instrument of torture, but it is such a beautiful instrument of torture because our Lord did all that for us. So that's why we, you know, celebrate the crucifix the way we do. And getting back to the evangelical churches, we have on occasion worked with evangelical churches, not very many of them, but it's been disheartening and you know, in the future, I'm not even sure if I would be prepared to do it because they just want to look like the next big box office church down the way. And it's, there's no, no beauty in what they want to have designed. It's, it's just strange to me. And life is too short. I, I don't want to create things that, that don't have the sort of meaning that they should have. So we, we probably wouldn't choose to work with them again because it's, it's just disheartening. Yes. That's one of the things that I found when I became Lutheran is that there is so much meaning and beauty and symbolism within Lutheranism that I never had growing up being word of faith and evangelical. And yeah, like even the way Lutheran churches are set up and designed and the different symbolism and things that are in it, it is so beautiful and it has so much meaning. And my husband and I, we, whether we visit a different church or we see something on the internet now and we think, wow, their churches are so bland. There's nothing, there's no meaning, there, there's no, it's almost like, yeah, there's no meaning there. And I think Lutheranism has, you could say, ruined us in that sense, in that we just want the beauty and the reverence and the yeah. symbolism. Yes. Yeah, and when so you true. read the Bible, you just see how through the Israelite culture and yeah, a lot of the things that God established, it's all very visual and tactile and the Lord himself set up a lot yeah. of these traditions and beautiful things because us humans, we thrive off of we really do. things and looking at things and <laughs> beauty. And yeah, why would you just suddenly stop all of that? That is so true. We went to Germany a couple of years back and we were just blown away by all the, the beautiful Lutheran stuff. Unfortunately, it was in 2013. So just before we decided to start at Crusom, because if we had already had that, we would have taken a lot more photographs and gotten a lot more ideas. But it's, it's one of my dreams to go back there and just make what they had more accessible to the Lutherans of this day by, you know, recreating it and bringing it into into the public life and making it possible again. So that's sort of what we, we aim to do. Yes. So you make some of the items yourself and we make, you have, yeah, everything that, that we sell, we make. Yes. So Yes. And you also sell items made by other artists and creators. Yes. Yeah. yes. So what standard do you follow when it comes to creating and choosing items to sell in your store? It has to be Christ-focused and it has to be theologically sound. And, you know, beauty is secondary to those two criteria. So if something is beautiful but doesn't have any meaning, then we reject it. We do get a couple of the artists who sort of try and push through something and if it doesn't have any symbolism or something that I can say, well, you know, okay, that's definitely Christian, then we, we just say, no, sorry, we, we can't carry that. And yeah, that's the most important thing. And then for us personally, it has to be, you know, very biblical and it really has to speak to us. So every year at Christmas time, my husband's in the garage making me some something new. Two years ago, he made me the Lord's Supper and it was, it was on the CNC machine. So you can see that on the website. And then last year, he made me the five loaves and the two fishes. And that was just gorgeous. Another wooden plaque that he made. And then one year, he made me a poster 
in two kinds. So it's Martin Luther on one side and one of the other pastors on the other side giving the Lord's Supper and both the body and the blood of Christ. So, you know, just every year it's, it's something different and it's more beautiful and more Christ-focused and, you know, harking back to Luther and Cronach and, and those days when when there was just so much more and it was, I guess it wasn't readily available. It was just, it, it feels like it was because there's so much history involved. But I'm sure that there were churches in those days too where they were also, you know, empty and and not filled with beauty. Yes. My husband and I, we were recently watching a documentary with the English actor David Suchet, and it was all about cathedrals across oh, Europe. Wow. And he was talking about the Reformation and how, of course, as Lutherans, we know that there wasn't just one Reformation. Yeah. There were the Reformations that followed afterwards. And he was just talking about how churches were stripped of their beauty. And yeah, things all the iconoclasts. Yeah. And it was really heartbreaking to hear. And of course, as Lutherans, we don't. Don't follow that at all. Mm. Yes. Yes. it Yes. But just to see some of the things that were destroyed in some churches, whatever they could destroy, they did just to try it because they saw it as an idolatry yeah. to have these beautiful things. Yeah. Well, once again, you know, getting back to my visit with my daughter in Rome this year, we went into a number of different churches, and it is sad to see that so many of them are focused on the saint instead of, you know, what Christ has done and images from Scripture. And they take the saints far too seriously, in, in my mind, if they would just spend more time focusing on who it was that the saint was believing in and trusting in, they would get a whole lot more out of their experience. But each of the churches that the saint is named for has the supposed bones of the saint buried under the altar. And I think that probably comes from that passage in Revelation, which promises that the martyrs are under God's altar and you know they're kept safe under the altar when they've suffered huge persecution. And to my mind, that is truly the most beautiful real estate in the whole universe because you cannot get safer than being under the altar of God. When somebody has been persecuted or killed for their faith, that's where God keeps them in the palm of his hand. And, you know, they're crying out to the Lord, how long, how long, O Lord? And only he knows, but we can trust him and know that that is a place of, of beauty and safety until the time that he comes back. Yeah. The saints themselves, if they knew, you know, how people were venerating them, they would yeah. probably be very upset. <laughs> they would I'm, go, sure. No, I'm sure. I'm sure the Lord blocks their ears. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> so how do your items confess the faith? It depends on what they are, obviously. With the Christmons, which is, I think, what probably put us on the map for Lutheranism, you know, mm -hmm. as I said, we've got a hundred different Christmonds. Each one has got important symbolism. So we've got baptism symbolized and the Lord's Supper symbolized and obviously the nativity story and the escape from Bethlehem by J Mary Joseph and, and the baby Christ. And then we've got the star and all sorts of ornaments. And then, you know, the, the symbols that Christ always said he was. So I'm the door and Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I want to hold you like a hen, mother hen holding its children. So we've got that. And with the lion, we've got the lion of Judah and we've got the pelican in her piety, which isn't quite, well, it's it's quoted in, in Psalms, but the story of the pelican sort of came in med the medieval time and not quite a biblical time. but And then we've got the, the phoenix rising from the ashes, which was actually quoted at the time of Christ because apparently there was, they said there was a phoenix that rose in those days and it was a secular source that said there was a phoenix. I think they were in Egypt or something. So that's why it was associated with Christ. And then the old Greek symbols, the Nika, which means he conquers, and the ICXC and the IHS, 
and the VDMA, which is obviously the battle cry of the Reformation, the word of the Lord endures forever. And that was first said by Isaiah and then by St. Peter, and then, of course, picked up by Martin Luther. So there's just so much history and beauty in each of these ornaments that we can draw from. And as the little family puts them up on the tree, you know, the mother will explain each one to the, the children. And that's where the sort of concept of knowing so much about it comes from. So that's the ornaments. And then, of course, we've got a lot of posters. We've got the Nicene Creed and the Apostles' Creed and the Athanasian Creed. And each of those is is really beautiful. And then we've got Martin Luther's Daily Prayers. And we've just done, for our 10th birthday, we did a, a series of small catechism posters. So all the six chief parts are represented by a different poster for the series of the small catechism. And that was created by an artist that we really love working with, Sam Novak, who is also a Lutheran, confessional Lutheran. And then we've got a lot of church banners, and the church banners are also very popular. And obviously they, they're sort of seasonal and done for the liturgical year, so it, it depends on which part of the year that they are. We've got some that are multi-season. So we've got um, the Agnes Day banners, one side is the Agnes Day slain and the other side is the Agnes Day victorious. And then we've got those in all the liturgical colors. So if a church wants to just have the same sort of banner, each part of the church here, then they would just choose that. Those are very popular. We've also got springily cookie molds. I don't know if you've ever had anything to do with the springily. There's this lady in St. Louis who I buy those from. And I buy all her Christian ones. So we've got Daniel in the lion's den. We've got Noah's book. And we've, she's got Martin Luther at the door of, of doing the 95 theses. So putting up the theses at, at the door. And I've got his face on a cookie. So we've got a whole series of, of those, which are very sweet as well. Beautiful. Yeah, I definitely want to go and have another look at your shop now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now on your website, there are two statements that talk about expression. So one of the statements is that you as a store have no interest in mere expression. And another statement is that the world doesn't need expressions of Lutheran identity. Now, I should have probably put in more of that statement, but what do you mean by mere expression? Our faith in Christ is not just lip service. Our Lutheran identity is our Christian identity. So we were responding to a liberal Lutheran store that is using just Lutheran expression, but embracing the things of this world. And they have gone very far from what it truly means to be Lutheran. So they're Lutheran in, in name only now. And we don't ever want to be that. We want to declare to the world with every single product that we make that Jesus Christ has died for their transgressions and has been raised again for their justification. And we don't want to make it wishy-washy in any way whatsoever. Life is way too short and eternity is way too serious for us to take this lightly. These are just trinkets that will one day burn away, but the people that we are seeking to impact with the stuff that we make, they are the ones that will last forever. And we want to see those people be with us in heaven, trusting in the Lord, worshiping the Lord, and understanding what it is that he has done for us. And that is so much more important than anything that we sort of do from a physical sense. We need to minister to the people. So every person who comes into my shop gets a copy of The Narrow Way Simply Shown, which is a book that was written by our pastors at our church. And it's actually, basically, it's taken from the website. So if you went to our, our church's website, you would be able to see what it is that we offer people. And what's in the book is explaining what we believe, why we believe it, where in scripture we can find those beliefs. And basically, you know, when I give it to somebody, I'm inviting them to attend with us. 
We haven't had too many people come in, although I do know that we have sort of impacted the lives of a number of people who've already been seeking. But I know that, you know, the wonderful thing about a book is it can stay on your bookshelf for a decade. And yet, if it wasn't on your bookshelf, at the point when you needed to have an answer from the Lord, you wouldn't be able to reach for it. And if it is on your bookshelf and you're saying, oh, Lord, help me, you know, help me to get out of this mess that I'm in or I'm just a dreadful human being or whatever it is that's that's causing the turmoil. That little book might then at that point, you know, point the person to coming in and speaking to the pastor or, you know, just knowing that they can find Christ or that Christ can find them and grant them salvation. So, you know, we plant little seeds all day long, and it's not necessarily for us to water them. It's the Lord that makes them grow anyhow. So we'll we'll trust in him, and I just pray that the people we do encounter are one day going to be with us in heaven. Yes. How important is the expression of our faith? Do we need the artwork and the buildings and the different items and the symbolism to express our Lutheran identity? How important are they? I don't think they are essential. You know, we can open our Bibles and I'm sure, you know, you also coming from a a different background, knowing that those things weren't always available to us. I mean, we still love the Lord and worship the Lord, but it's just so exciting to have so many little trinkets that remind us of, of what Christ has done. So it is good to have them, but not essential. It is good to have a beautiful church where you can just sit and and admire the crucifix whilst listening to the sermon. And, you know, for a little child who's not quite understanding what the sermon says, if there are beautiful stained glass windows there for him to look at and to, you know, think of what Jesus has done for him, you know, those are all wonderful things to have. And, you know, also when the world has gone dark and people aren't there proclaiming the truth. The stones that we see in the churches that, you know, have these beautiful things will still be crying out to the people. Even when the Christians are no longer crying out if or un, are unable to cry out. I mean, if you go into a cemetery and you find beautiful Christian images on, on the tombstones, those are also proclaiming, you know, we have this hope in Christ and we can trust in him. Even in the grave, we trust in him, in what our God has done and will do for us. And, you know, even with my own eyes, I will see him, not with somebody else's eyes, but with these very eyes, I'm going to see him again one day. And that's why, you know, we believe in being buried rather than being cremated, because we want to proclaim to the world the hope that we have. And on sort of just on attention to that, we also offer for free any, if tombstone makers need Lutheran images, we are happy to offer our images to them to use without any charge. And we've done that for a couple of people already. So yeah, they can use those images and proclaim to the world when nobody else is looking. That's beautiful. To finish off this interview, are there any resources that you would like to share with our listeners and where can our listeners find you? Our website is www.adcrucem.com. That's A-D-C-R-U-C-E-M.com. And we've also got a sub stack. My husband writes most of the stuff for the sub stack. He's into writing a lot more than I am. And then also Ecclesiastical Sewing, which is this beautiful liturgical stuff that Carrie Roberts makes in Michigan. She's also Lutheran and was also started in 2014, which is quite interesting. And then, of course, you know, Pastor Brian Wolfmuller, he read out or he put a podcast on reading out Luther's sermons a few years back. And when my sister passed away, I actually listened to those sermons day and night for months on end because when I couldn't sleep, the comfort of what Luther had said in these sermons just helped me to rest and I just played them over and over again. And I still on occasion when I'm feeling down or anything like that, I go back to listening to Luther's sermons because they are just so beautiful and so rich in, you know, just in beautiful words that he used and he really had 
such knowledge of, of the scriptures. And then, yeah, also our church, as I said, Trinity Lutheran in Denver. If you were to Google Trinity Lutheran in Denver, you would find our website. And we are, have a number of resources. They are free to download and we encourage other churches to use them because not every church has a huge budget where they can, you know, just have people creating all this stuff. So we encourage them and it's it's all free. And also a number of our books on the website are available as free PDFs as well. So we've got a very different publishing model. We have most of it in, in the Creative Commons so that people can use it and benefit from it. Yes, and of course, we'll link all of this down in the show notes as well, so people can easily just click on the link and find what you've mentioned. But thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a real pleasure chatting with you. Well, thank you so much for inviting me, and it's lovely to get to know you both, and I wish you both all the best with the new babies that are coming. It's it's so exciting. Thank you. They will have been born by the time this episode comes out. Here She Stands is an Australian podcast for Lutheran women and we release new episodes every two weeks on a Tuesday. You can find us on all major podcasting platforms as well as YouTube. You can also follow on Facebook and Instagram. If you'd like to contact us directly, our email address is hereshestands.podcast at gmail.com. Until next time, we pray that you will hold fast to God's word and confidently say, Here I stand, I can do no other.